Good morning, everybody. Uh, like Derek said, you know, who the heck am I? Uh, I'm Jason. That's me. And you might be wondering, okay, you know, there was a long list. And thank you, Jarek, for the uh, the shout out. Actually, I'm going to repeat a lot of what I had. You know, why should you listen to me? Well, to be honest, maybe you shouldn't. I think I do have some cool things to say. Um, I am a chief information security officer. I have CISSP, CISM, Ugh. SCUBA. SCUBA is a little self-deprecation about how many certifications and how many acronyms we like having behind our names. I've been in tech for 20 plus years, security focused for 10 of those, and I've been a CISO for about seven more. Also, I went to University of Oregon, so I got a shout out to Go Ducks. Um, and I also live in Los Angeles, and it's sort of a precursor, or a, I think it might be a city ordinance that if you live in Los Angeles, you must have your own podcast. So I also have a podcast called F Sides. It's called the Cyber Humanity Podcast. My co-host Paul Love and I have been doing it. Um, we're on our first season, and if you get a chance to check it out, it's pretty cool. We talk about sort of the more human side of cybersecurity. So, you know, full story, right? Yay. But who am I? Who's Jason? Why am I talking today? Well, Jarek really summed it up here is that, you know, cybersecurity is what I do, but really my passion is in leadership, organizational decision making, and giving to those who have less through national international disaster relief. And I really believe that it's these types of interests that make me a better cybersecurity practitioner. What am I about? Well, these are sort of my core values, and you're going to see them sort of rub off in this presentation. I don't take myself too serious. I believe in humility. I believe that you can learn something from everyone or anyone. I believe in helping those that have less. I like to have fun in life and in work. And while I'm not religious per se, I absolutely have faith in humanity. I believe most people try to do good in most situations most of the time. And you know what? Sometimes they fail. It's part of what makes us human. So today I'm going to talk about cybersecurity and lessons in teams and how I built high-functioning security teams. These are some of the problems that I've seen out there. I've seen that cybersecurity is often seen as a hard, like hard and soft sciences. It's considered a hard science. Team building leadership is soft, often gets overlooked, deprioritized, and is misunderstood. It's often perceived, in my opinion, I see senior leadership seeing it as a waste of time. The idea that advancing team building capabilities is viewed as a waste of time when you really just want to spend the funding and the money on tech. Uh, it's also viewed as just not being, not focused on technology. I mean, how often do you see team trainings given towards the socio-psychological aspects of a team? It's really just based on, you know, more of the science and the technology. <laughs> and then one of the things that I just can't stand are trust falls. I think they've given a bad name is that everybody thinks you go to this one offsite, you do a couple trust falls. Hey, we're a team. We're working great together. So I think these are some of the problems that I've seen that I'm going to try to speak through to show how I've addressed them. Um, it's also important to note, I, I went to Black Hat this past year and found out that I was not crazy, and SANS has something to do with this. So there was this amazing study that was done called Improving Social Maturity of Cybersecurity Incident Response Teams. And I just found out about this two months ago, realized that my whole idea that I'm not crazy with this is true. This was a study that was funded by the Department of Homeland Security, George Mason University, Dartmouth, and the kind of Sweden and in the Netherlands. It was the largest social behavioral study of InfoSec teams to date, it took five years, 20 plus researchers were involved, 28 multi-team systems they analyzed across 17 organizations across US and Europe. Uh, it's an amazing report. It's very big and thick, but it's worth reading. And if it had these incredible findings across this, it found that responding to incidents, cybersecurity incidents, is an intensely social process. And successful incident response requires integration of both the tech and the social processes, meaning how well you function as a team. And that failures in the incident response were often attributed to poor collaboration among team members. The highlight of some of the problems, there are a lot of problems this study found, but it was that failure to share unique information, poor communication, lack of trust, and interpersonal, not cognitive conflict. I'm gonna talk about all four of those in today's presentation. So this is an amazing study and it just made me go, wow, I'm not insane. Um, I first learned about it at the SANS Blueprint podcast, episode 29, check it out. And I believe they presented this at Black Hat Europe 2021. I'm gonna start with some quotes from high performing teams. This comes from a book called The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. Great book. He studied a bunch of high performing teams across different verticals and he got these quotes out of them. This is a great quote from a high functioning team. I can't explain it 
but things just feel right. I've actually tried to quit a couple times, but I keep coming back to it. There's no feeling like it. These guys are my brothers. That was from Christopher Baldwin using U.S. Navy SEAL Team 6. Next quote. It's a rush knowing that you can take a huge risk and these people will be there to support you no matter what. We are addicted to that feeling. It was Nate Dern, Upright Citizens Brigade. If you're not familiar with them, they're a uh, stand-up, I believe, improv comedy group. This is from Dwayne Bray from IDEO Design. IDEO Design is a very famous design firm in Silicon Valley. They did the Motorola Razor phone, among other things. We are all about being a familiar group because it allows you to take more risks, give each other permission, and have moments of vulnerability that you could never have in a more normal setting. He also found these patterns across these high-performing teams. He found that high-performing teams have close physical proximity, often in circles. There's a profuse amount of eye contact, a lot of physical touching, fist bumps, hugs, lots of short energetic exchanges, no long-winded speeches, high levels of mixing where everyone on the team talked to everyone, few interruptions of people team of other team members, lots and lots of questions, this intensive active listening, a lot of humor and laughter, and they had a lot of small attentive courtesies, things like thank yous and opening doors. These were the, just the traits that he found across high-performing teams. You might be going, okay, you know, it's great that these high-performing teams, Jason, why do you think that you're even valid speaking on this? Well, um, my, my last company I was at, we did a culture survey. You might have met your company, they're called Culture Amp, and it's this survey that gets a assessment of how happy the employees are in their role and at the company they're at and the team that they're on. My team out of a company of about 2,200 people scored a 96% compared to the average score of the company was 67%. My team consistently year over year was the highest scoring team right below the three C-level executives. So it really validated that, you know, what my teams were doing and what I was building with this and how my approach to this works. This is the one takeaway. If you're screenshotting it or <laughs> take a picture, grab your camera, this is probably the one takeaway that I'm trying to get across during this presentation. How your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. And if you were to come in literally about in about another five minutes into this presentation, you might think you're you might think you're at a Smithsonian Historical Society presentation because I'm going to talk about some things in history. I'm a big fan of case study method. I'm going to be talking today about JFK. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mount Everest. I'm going to go to street hockey, and I'm going to talk about Pope Leo the Tenth. I know it's crazy, but these case studies are to me, a, a great way to educate and a great reference point instead of just saying, don't take my word for it. Here's an example of somebody who was successful before and they applied these and why they applied it and why it was successful. Here's the agenda. I'm gonna give three quick case study stories. I'm gonna talk about the five dysfunctions of a team framework, which I believe is the framework everybody should follow and it's very simple. And I'm really gonna focus on two cornerstones of those five dysfunctions. And then I'm going to give you five takeaways, meaning five things that I think you could start doing today or this week or next month um, that, can drive, that can drive some of the changes that I'm saying you can do. Let's start with the first story, and it's called the Bay of Pigs. The Bay of Pigs, um, if you're not familiar, it was an invasion in April 1961. It was this failed attack launched by the Central Intelligence Association, Association <laughs> Agency during the Kennedy administration to push Cuban leader Fidel Castro from power. On April 17th of 61, the CIA launched what the United States believed was gonna be the definitive move. It was a full-scale invasion of Cuba by 1400 American trained Cubans who fled their homes when Castro took over. To put it frank, the results were a complete fiasco. Most rebels were killed or captured. Castro retained power his internal prestige grew and it horribly badly damaged US-Soviet relations. The invasion actually, they believe that that invasion and the failure of that invasion is what led the Soviets to place nuclear missiles in Cuba, which we'll be talking about next. If you were to do an after action report, uh, if you're on incident response teams or any kind of team, you'll sometimes do these things where you take a look back after, after the incident or cybersecurity incidents, you'll look back and go, okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? and it helps you improve. It's part of that improvement process. Well, if you're to do that for the Bay of Pigs, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna walk through an AAR and show some of the examples of some of the things they could have improved on. Um, here's one. One, they met in the cabinet room. 
<laughs> you may be wondering why the heck of where they met, is that even important? We'll get to that with the next case study. Uh, two, the CIA played the role of both advocate and the evaluator. That means they were both advocating for the solution and they were evaluating the validity of the solution. The decision-making process itself was veiled in secrecy. It wasn't open. Key experts in the administration didn't partake in the cabinet meetings to discuss, meaning they had people that knew a lot about the situation and they weren't even in the discussion. There was no candid dialogue. Many people were holding back concerns that they had. Assumptions were running rampant. Nobody was challenging assumptions. And the CIA dominated the meetings. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the head of the military, oddly remained silent. This was another key one too in decision making is that no alternatives were given. It was viewed as either a binary go or no go. Rank and hierarchy played a strong role in the process. I can't see hands, but raise your hands if any time you think a decision making process at your organization, rank and hierarchy plays a role. And then there's this cognitive bias that was at play. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cognitive biases throughout this presentation, but it's called the sunk cost effect. It's this idea that you invest so much into something, you got to keep going and you got to do it just because you invested it. And the CIA had this and they felt they had to move forward because of all the time and investment they put into it. So these were interesting AARs of some of the failures of why the Bay of Pigs was such a fiasco and why the decision was a bad decision. Now we're going to look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, which happened shortly after. And we're going to do an AAR on that and look at the changes that Kennedy made. Proactive, he made these organizational decision-making changes during the Cuban Missile Crisis. What was the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, this was a 13-day political military standoff in October 62 over the installation of those nuclear missiles I talked about earlier, just 90 miles from US shores. It was estimated that those, nine, that those missiles could kill about 80 million Americans. So it was a big deal. And what happened was on October 22nd, 1962, JFK, they made the decision. They notified the Americans about the presence of the missiles. He explained that they enacted a naval blockade around Cuba, made it very clear publicly that the U.S. was prepared to use military force if necessary. This was probably the closest the world's come to on the brink of nuclear war. Disaster was avoided uh, through the naval blockade because Soviet leader Khrushchev agreed to remove the Cuban missiles in exchange for the U.S. promising not to invade Cuba. So the crisis was averted. But as I said, Kennedy changed his decision-making process. He, he changed how his group was going to make the decisions and how he led the decision-making process. Let's do the AAR with this. So the change was, remember how I said before, they met in the cabinet. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he had them meet in the State Department. Why is that important? Well, the cabinet room is you, see, you sit down based on hierarchy. The Secretary of State's at the head of the table. The Secretary of Agriculture man, he's lucky if he gets on the White House grounds. So it's a very hierarchical seating arrangement. In the State Department, little like the round table, everybody sits everywhere. It was, in fact, if you remember King Arthur in the round table, it was round because everyone was equal. He formed this, this big group of everybody called XCOM. And then because there were two prevailing ideas at the time, he split them into two subgroups. The two prevailing ideas were either a blockade or a strike. And he had each of those groups create white papers and then swap white papers to challenge each other for the two prevailing options. Then he also assigned this concept of a devil's advocate. I'm gonna talk about that later as well. His brother, Bobby Kennedy and Theodore Sorensen, he assigned these devil's advocate to poke holes in the plans on each of those teams and those subgroups. Kennedy also chose not to participate in a lot of the meetings because he believed that there was more frank discussions when the leader wasn't in the room. People were expected to speak up even if it was not their area of expertise. He inv invited outside unbiased experts. And then this was a key, uh, a key concept and a key thing that he did. He had each subgroup, once they made their decision, they said, hey, okay, we believe we should do a naval blockade and that was our, that's our recommendation. He had each subgroup write a speech as if they were president, notifying the US citizens, letting, letting Americans know why they were choosing this course of action. That's a brilliant uh, framing device um, if you're not using that as a leader yourself and going, hey, what, what is it like to be CEO of our company and telling people why we're doing this action? And another key thing he did was rules of protocol were suspended. Everyone was equal. There was no rank in the room. 
he also met with his predecessor Eisenhower for a nice advice and input. And Eisenhower is another great case study in leadership. You know, he was chosen as Supreme Allied Commander not because he was the best stat the best uh, strategic military personnel, but because he knew how to bring teams together. Crisis was averted. The U.S. and Soviet reached this accord on Cuba, and the world was at peace. It's one of the one of the best changes that you can when you analyze how go from a poor decision making process as a team to great decision making process. So you might be wondering, you yeah, know, that's great. How does this apply to cybersecurity? Well, it doesn't get much more <laughs> much more high stakes than global thermonuclear war. I think it's probably one of the most high stakes decision making processes you can you could ever think of. And it involves, like we do in cybersecurity, involves trust, psychological safety, and conflict and debate. And I'll be talking about those more in detail in, in a few. Let's talk about the, this is my second story. Let's talk about the devil's advocate. This is a great history behind the devil's advocacy. Here's the history of how it came about. In the late 16th century, Pope Clement VII started the secret canonization process for a dude named Lawrence Justinian. This guy, everyone was on board for this guy to be a saint. He was a beloved figure. He gave up his nobility and wealth to serve the church. He was one righteous dude. But Pope Leo X, Clement's predecessor, well, he thought becoming a saint should be kind of a big deal. He didn't want it to be hasty and automatic. He knew that there was this bias at work when we're deciding on saints. It was the confirmation bias. And he realized this confirmation bias plays a big role in making saints. Saints were made by popular acclamation, and there were thousands of these local saints. But Pope Leo wanted to protect the church from saints who didn't deserve to be saints. So he assigned a priest to argue against every candidate for sainthood. He created this promoter of the faith. That's what they called it. Meaning, think about that. It was a promoter of the faith. You were a protectorate of the church. And that role was called, ad, I'm going to slaughter my Latin, advocatus diaboli, devil's advocate. This role the sole role was to poke holes in what was being presented in question testimony. To put that in perspective, from 1000 AD to 1978, about 450 men and women were canonized as saints. In 1983, Pope John Paul II retired the position of the devil's advocate. And during his reign, reign's not the right word, while he was saint from 1978 to 2004, 480 saints were canonized when they removed the devil's advocacy program. So I'm not challenging whether or not they should be saints or not, but um, the devil's advocacy as a role and as a process is very important. And how does the devil's advocate role apply to cybersecurity? Is your team openly challenging each other? Are assumptions being made and no one's challenging those assumptions? Is there confirmation bias at play during incident analysis or strategic planning and roadmap sessions? And is it even safe for the team to challenge that? That's what I'm going to talk later about implementing the devil's advocate on your team. It's a great process and a great role. My last story, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, these ads suck. <laughs> um, in the early 2000s, there was a race to build a software engine that connected search with targeted ads. A company called Overture based in L.A., was the overwhelming favorite. They're well-funded. They were led by the guy who invented pay-per-click, Bill Gross. They had the intelligence, the experience, and the resources to win. If you would have asked anybody on Wall Street who's going to win this race, Overture would, hands down, would have, would have been, you're the one. But Overture didn't win. A small, young company, not young anymore, young, young back then, called Google won. And the moment that turned that race in Google's favor could be placed back to Google's kitchen at their headquarters in Mountain View on May 24th, 2002. It's when the Google founder, Larry, Larry Page, pinned this note to the wall. It said, these ads suck. And it's all about street hockey, town halls, and culture, and ultimately psychological safety. Larry Page wasn't your traditional businessman. You know, you describe his leadership style. He would just have, he loved big, energetic, no holds barred debates about strategy, technology, product, and ideas. To work at Google was like to enter a big continuous wrestling match where no one was above the fray, not Larry, not the coder, not the developer, not the analyst. And it extended out into their all employee street hockey games. 
every Friday, they'd have in the Google parking lot street hockey games. And no one, everyone was expected not to hold back when you're fighting for the puck. If you're fighting for it with Larry, you're expected to go full bore. And this also happened at their all company Friday forums. Any employee could challenge or question the founders with any question that they had. Google's engine that they had in that race at the time was called AdWords. But like he posted, it sucked. If you're going to look for a Kawasaki H1B motorcycle, you're going to get a bunch of postings and, and advertisements for finding an H1B visa. So Larry Page printed a bunch of these examples, wrote three words on it, posted this whole package of all the problems, posted it on the kitchen bulletin board. Come by this guy named Jeff Dean. Um, you know, Jeff Dean was walking through the kitchen, having a cappuccino on a front, getting a cappuccino on a late Friday afternoon. It wasn't even his job to work it, but he looked at it for no particular reason. He decided he didn't even ask for permission. He just worked on it. He worked on it over the weekend and he ended up fixing it. In that year, profits went from 6 million to 99 million. By 2014, AdWords was generating 160 million per day. Google didn't win because, or Overture didn't, didn't, didn't win because of intelligence or even Jeff Dean himself. Google won because they had psychological safety. It was safe to challenge. It was safe to step out and do something. It was safe to do whatever you wanted to do. That's why they won. So how does this fit for cybersecurity? Is your team having those debates on technology solutions? Is everybody, is everybody above the fray? That thing of like, you know, are you people that are your lowest level analysts or your low lo lowest level engineers? Do they feel they can speak up and give a say in something? Does every one of your team have equal input? Does your leader have deference in meetings or incidents as CISO? I know that when I walk into a room, people defer to me as the expert and it's tough to challenge that. So remember, this is the takeaway. So those were sort of the stories that give um, examples of some that I'm gonna use in my the rest of this presentation. But just remember this, how your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. Let's talk five dysfunctions of a team. This is an amazing framework. It's a really short book. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. It's a, it's a fable. People like storytelling. Another reason, it's, it is a case study. It's a fictional case study, but it's a case study. And it's a great story. And it says there's these five things your team need to be functional. And you could look at it as do these five things or rather, you know, um, teams that aren't functioning well have these problems. One is they don't trust each other. And that trust, then if they're not trusting each other, they can't conflict. And I'm going to dig in pretty deep on conflict later. And if they can't conflict, it's sort of a pyramid. You got to start at the base. You have to have trust each other. It then allows you to be able to conflict, meaning have cognitive conflict about ideas, and then be able to commit to a course of action as a team. And to be able to hold each other accountable this is the next level in the pyramid. And then finally, what are the results that we're trying to attain as a team? But you really, in my opinion, focus on these two. These are the hardest and you're gonna get the most value and it's pretty, well, it's not easy. <laughs> it's, it's a process, but I really, the, you know, the two cornerstones, but we're gonna focus on trust and I'm gonna talk about conflict today. The two cornerstones, trust and conflict. Trust. Ooh, it is the foundation of all relationships from Navy SEALs to that XCOM as a leader or a contributor. Can you trust your teammate? Can you trust your leader? The behaviors that are gonna build that trust, and a number one, it always starts with the leader, is vulnerability. Are you being vulnerable as a leader? That's not just once doing a trust fall or in one meeting during a year sharing, yeah, you know, I get scared when I do this. It is continual showing that you're vulnerable, being open and honest and being transparent. Being authentic and showing empathy. And lastly, allowing your team to fail. You have to remove failure and the fear of failure. People are gonna fail all the time. It should be expected. It's how you recover from the failure that's important. And as a leader, it's your job to make sure that it's okay to fail. Everything comes down to your behavior. And this isn't a one and done. This is showing that vulnerability, being transparency and, on, and honest, being authentic and open is a continual process. You can't just do it one day at an offsite. Practice, 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 repeat, rinse and repeat. Um, yep, just like Yoda even once said, uh, I'm not going to actually do a Yoda voice, but I'm not going to do it here. One offsite does not a trusting team make. 
let's talk about conflict. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, it, I'm actually, I'm a little patriotic, but I, I believe that this is you know, something in our country that we could use more of. Freedom is hammered out on the anvil of discussion, discussion, dissension, and debate. Hubert Humphrey. And another great quote and one that I live as as a leader, this is from Barry Rand, the former CEO of Avis. If I have a yes man working for me, one of us is redundant. We are under immense pressure to make good to be good decision makers. Whether it's decisions about how to apply limited resources to maximize risk reduction, or during cybersecurity incidents when we're under the fog of war. If you want good decisions and you want creative ideas, constructive conflict and debate are required. If you're in a room and only one person is speaking and the CISO or the leader is making the decision or the SME is driving the decision and nobody is disagreeing with them, you have a problem. One of my favorite stories about how creativity, how conflict breeds creativity is from a show, old, old, <laughs> old, old. I might be dating myself. I actually was not alive during the show, uh, but I know it. It's called um, Sid Caesar's Show of Shows. And this show had the greatest comedic writers of a generation in the writer's room, Mel Brooks, Neil Simon, Woody Allen, Carl Reiner. And if you were to walk into their writing room, it was, it, it looked like a war zone. It, they fought, they argued, they would, they, people would walk into the morning room and there'd be, you know, they'd have a, a voodoo doll of Mel Brooks hung in effigy, like making fun of him because of the decisions he made for writing. But they'd go out and have dinner and drinks and were best friends out of sight of this room. But the arguments were loud and contentious because they were debating and conflicting the ideas and the topic. It's cognitive conflict. It's, is this the best decision? Well, maybe we could write it like this. Maybe we change this instead. And the creativity that flowed out of that show with conflict. In fact, it's often said in writer's rooms, if you're not having conflict in that writer's room, you have a really bad writer's room. Getting teams to channel emotions that bring out task-oriented, not interpersonal debate is absolutely necessary to get to good decisions. Look what JFK did. You know, he made the two teams white, write white papers and disagree with each other. And he input that devil's advocate to make sure that to sort of prime that debate, to prime those questions. And as a leader, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're doing that. Either you play the devil's advocate role to poke holes and kind of challenge and get some conflict going, or you assign that role out. And remember that effective conflict where you're conflicting with the person is bad. You always debate the ideas and not the person. One of my favorite examples of uh, another example of poor decision making was um, the 1996 Mount Everest um, tragedy. It was uh, made famous in John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, um, in 1996. And this was a uh, showed how cognitive biases played this crucial role in tragedy and created flawed decision makings. Uh, during this climb, there was a deference to expertise where the SME, uh, the subject matter expert, I'm throwing acronyms people may not know, but the SME was deferred to and like, oh, they know what they're talking about. There was a lack of conflict. Everybody just group got into this thing called groupthink where we all just decide because, oh yeah, the, the, the subject matter thinks it's the way to go. We should go that way. And there was a lot of, of uh, cognitive biases at play, including sunk cost, confirmation bias, and information asymmetry. Um, good teams. You should read the Harvard Business Review case study behind this. I think I've referenced it later in the presentation. Uh, it's a great short 10-pager. Uh, and these were the cognitive biases at play at Mount Everest and things that, again, having that conflict can override a lot of these. You've got to have that debate and that conflict to get over these cognitive biases, but you need to have that trust and that psychological safety to do so. Here's my five takeaways of the five things that I think out of all the stuff that I've thrown at you, five things that I think you can start doing. One, I highly recommend you take the five dysfunction survey every year for your team. It's available free, you can Google for it. Um, I think I have a link to it in my presentation. There's also through the table group, they offer an online version of it, which is great because it provides scoring. And get your team to read five dysfunctions of a team. If you're like, oh, I don't want to read. There's books on tape. And there's even a MAGA version. MAGA, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. <laughs> there's a Japanese uh, animation uh, book version of it too. And I highly just recommend focus on the first two. And in fact, you'll probably focus on trust for the first year. It isn't easy. It's rinse and repeat. Trust isn't something you're going to build in a day. You're not going to build it when your team reads the book and after they take the survey. And the survey, by the way, is a barometer. We all know in cybersecurity, if you can't measure it, you can't improve. 
This dysfunction survey is very simple, takes maybe 10 minutes, and it's a great barometer and a great baseline measurement to see how your team is functioning across those five dysfunctions. Number two, uh, do like I do and use case studies uh, as examples of building great teams. There's a lot out there. I think I referenced another one. There's a great story about uh, the Man Gulch Fire of 1949, a great study of firefighters and failure of leadership um, and how to improve. And it gives you a great discussion. So instead of focusing on cybersecurity all day, it breaks the monotony. You know, <laughs> anything by Greg Popovich, by the way, you should read. This guy, uh, San Antonio Spurs coach, every season, He'll start out the team practice where they spend an hour or two in the locker room talking about anything but basketball. Get your head out of cybersecurity, focus on something else. Talk about things in life or in general and not focus on cybersecurity. And remember, rinse and repeat. These are all practices you need to put in place and repeat them over time. From habits around these case study, form habits around case studies and stories. Make it a habit of every annual offsite or every annual time you get your team together that you're going to do that. Yeah, I knew I was going to reference it later. Here's some examples of Man Gulch Fire of 1949. Great story. Uh, if you read about Draper Kaufman and how the Navy SEALs were formed, another great story, um, especially if you look about teamwork and how they did that. And I'm, another, I'm a fan of Danny Meyer and his restaurants and how he leads his teams in restaurants. Some other references here. And the book Extreme Ownership is written by two Navy SEALs, and it's all about how a leader is ultimately responsible for his team. My number three recommendation, go climb a mountain. <laughs> if you have offsites, even if they're virtual or remote, um, and after you've introduced your team to the five dysfunctions, have your team read the Mount Everest business case. It's the Harvard Business Review business case. And then there's a great simulation where your team actually climbs a mountain and has to make decisions as a team. Um, and it's a simulation. It's amazing. And it's a, instead of just, it's not only a case study, but it's an interactive case study and you get to climb a mountain for a couple hours. And it's based on the Harvard, it's actually was created by the professor who wrote the Harvard Business Review case of the 96 climb. It's amazing, it's engaging, and has a lot of lessons learned about cognitive biases, information asymmetry, and that everything that I talked about previously about trust and conflict. And ultimately, as a leader, uh, you know, Lizzo does it best, be your own CEO. This is probably a risky, risky to say in front of this audience, but it is better to ask forgiveness for permission. You don't need help from your HR team. Do it yourself. Nike, just do it. Run your team your way and build your culture. And if you are the leader, you are ultimately responsible for your team. One of the best stories about ultimate responsibility is out of extreme ownership. I'm going to I'm going to share with you that story. Um, it's at the very beginning, and it's Navy SEALs when they're in Hell Week. They put on teams of, I forgot, six, seven? Teams of six or seven, and they have to own this boat. It's the, the pontoon boat that you see. It's a Zodiac boat. And they have to, they do these races where they have to carry the boat overhead. They have to put it down, and they have to chase each other and race. And this one team kept coming in last. And when he went to the master, the master chief, and he's like, chief, I just, you know, my team sucks. These guys just can't pick it up, man. I just wish I had a better team. They're like, really? Okay. We're going to swap you, you as leader with the number, with the number one team. We're going to give you the number one team that's in first place. And then we'll put that leader from number one team onto your last place team. The next race, that last place team with a new leader came in second. And I was fully showing the idea that ultimately as leader, as a Navy SEAL, you're ultimately responsible and leadership does mean everything. Lastly, my tip is normalize this behavior and make it cultural. You have to rinse and repeat. You're not going to have one offsite and read the book. Yay, problem solved. Cyber, just like cybersecurity is a program, it's not a one and done. People go, hey, okay, we bought that tool. Are you done? No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a process and it's a program. Team culture is the same way. Repetition. Behavior can create team norms. Make your team feel safe every day. Show vulnerability be open and honest as a leader and show that you trust them every day. Ultimately, this is what you should take away from this. How your teams are making decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. Some of my references for takeaway for readings, these are some of the great books that I use as references. Uh, I believe this presentation will be shared out later or you can screenshot it now. And that does it. Thank you very much for your time for putting up with me today. <laughs>